hold, hold, that, hold that phone up for the camera for me. There you go. What uh, what is that called? <laughs> it's called a flip phone, man. It's a Kia Sierra. <laughs> it's the old uh, it's the old Nextel uh, digital pager. I think they like they got that line or whatever. It has a digital pager, but I don't have anybody to page. So <laughs> you can page me. <laughs> Welcome to Digital Hospitality. I am your host, Sean Walchef. This is a Cali BBQ Media production. I am not going to cut that out of the episode because I love Will so much. And he, <laughs> I, I've been looking forward to this episode because uh, him and I have hit it off. We've, I found him on LinkedIn. Um, I was on his show, Restaurant Owners Uncorked. And uh, the man is a gift to our industry. He also has an antithesis to digital hospitality, yet even though he's a tech founder that helps restaurateurs. <laughs> so we're going to get into it today. It's going to be an awesome conversation. If you guys are new to the show, welcome. Uh, this is the first guest I think I've ever had on that has a flip phone. So we're going to start with the flip phone. <laughs> On his LinkedIn bio, Will says, holla at my flip phone, and he puts his phone number, 704-906-2031, and he started the show off, showing off him calling me on his flip phone. <laughs> Will, dude, I'm so grateful to have you on the show. What's up? That was not, that, I was actually trying to call you because we couldn't get the audio to work. I wasn't trying to show off my phone. It's most people. Oh, I was going to get phone, the phone. That was, that, that <laughs> was, that was my goal from day one. It was to get this, uh, make sure I got the flip phone in the video. Yeah, I do put it on my LinkedIn. I, you, look, it's on our, it's on Schedulefly's website in three, a public website on three pages. Like, yes. there's my personal cell phone number. It's the opposite of what most people would want to do, which is I don't want my number all. But you know what, man? It's like, it, like I wish it would get used more, right? Like uh, people, it's just you know, there's a lot of s s noise and a lot of stuff. And I'm still a phone guy. I like having phone conversations, so I don't. Like I check my voicemails and I return my voicemails and I like getting phone calls and I like talking to people. So um, a little bit old fashioned maybe, but it's just how I roll. Tell me about phone calls. We haven't talked about phone calls on this show and we have restaurant tours. We have tech people. We have sales people, marketing people. Uh, we've built this amazing community. If you guys are listening, if you're new, welcome. Um, if you're a, an old listener, thank you for listening to this show. I only bring the best of the best on because I want to give you a, <laughs> a seat at the table at the cutting edge of what we're trying to do with efficiency, how to become more hospitable using technology and, and doing a better job of storytelling and having a story being told to you over the phone. Let's start there. Do you remember our first phone call? Yeah, man. And you actually inspired probably why I'm sitting in the studio right now. I mean, you really inspired me. We kind of did, we've been doing this podcast, our, our, you know, our restauranters in court podcast for a long time, but really just, you know, never, uh, never, never really tried to take it to the next level. I mean, I, I had like, when I started that thing, it was a, USB microphone for 35 bucks from Best Buy attached to my laptop, you know, recorded on a speakerphone holding my phone next to the microphone, uh, the $35 mic. And uh, we hadn't come a whole lot further from that since then. But, um, you know, I think we were a little ahead of the curve, to be honest with that stuff. We started that podcast like 10 years ago and I had to beg people to come on the thing, Sean. Like, they're like, that was a podcast. Like, what is a pod? Why? Why would I come? So it's a little bit different now, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm super inspired. Like I'm inspired by people like you that go out there and you're creative and you're innovative and you're shit. You understand the importance of sharing stories and you do a great job of it. And you're creating all this incredible media and we have all those tools now, you know, right at our fingertips. Uh, I mean, I don't have all of them cause I've got that thing, but um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful thing. And particularly you know, in our situation, I mean, my company, Schedulefly, just serves independent restaurants and they often, you know, they just don't have a platform to share their stories. They, you know, they don't often have the time and the energy and don't know how to share their stories. And we like to, we like to do that for them. I've always enjoyed sharing the stories of, of restaurant people. I'm so inspired by you and your peers and people that own and run restaurants because I realized quickly Years ago, I, I don't have what it takes. And so I admire people that do have what it takes. And I always learn from people that, that do what y'all do. For me, I'm inspired when I hear someone's truth that is 
different than what the majority of people talk about. Uh, we see trending topics. We hear things that other people see. We see it in you know regular media, new media, old media. Of these are the things. This is how you succeed when you when you scale, when you build a business. What kind of business are you building? And when yeah. you and I had a conversation, you were explaining Schedule Fly, Fly, the origin story, how you guys started, and the fact that you're still the same as when you started. And it was such a profound statement because, you know, we have a lot of technology partners. We're fortunate that, you know, the best in class that we work with, obviously the toast of the world restaurant 365. And these are companies with hundreds, thousands of employees. And we also work with, you know, beginning tech founders, but you guys aren't beginning. You've been doing this for a long time and you found something that works. You found something that resonates. Can you share the origin stories of the schedule fly and where you are today? And, and the yeah. fact that you've, you've stayed true to that mission. Yeah, man, I'm I'm happy to. I mean, we, you know, there's five of us here, and we've had the same five it's since amazing. 2007. So April of 2024 <laughs> will be amazing. seven seventeen years uh, doing this with the same five people. And um, you know, I mean, our origin story was simply that you know, uh, there's there's three of us that own the business out of the five, and um, Wes Aiken has written every line of code uh, for our software, and he used to create the schedule in a restaurant you know, 20 some odd years ago, 25 years ago, whatever it was when he was in college at the bridge tender in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. And he'd sit there, you know, every Sunday afternoon and sit in his apartment and try to piece together a schedule and Excel based on this stack of, you know, handwritten chicken scratch notes on the back of a receipt, like I want Tuesday off or, you know, just whatever. And he would like try to take all that and make sense of it, piece together the schedule and then drive it down to the restaurant. This is in the, like the nineties, right? And post it, this piece of paper. And then as soon as it gets posted, everybody's calling in or coming in, they're looking at it and changes are being made. And this whole, this, this work of art has just completely changed very quickly and changes all, you know, throughout the week. And um, so he, he had this idea to just write a real simple, software solution for that so that, you know, instead of calling in or coming in and or calling and getting the wrong, somebody tells you the wrong schedule, all the stuff that came with that, the idea was, why don't we just provide this really simple solution that eliminates the need for all these phone calls and all these fire drills when somebody's sick and just have email and text and an app and just a way to just get this information to people. And then when the changes happen, it's automatic. And of course, there's tons of companies doing that now. When we started in 07, it was like, it's basically us and like hot schedules that just started and I mean, it's wild west. And, um, <laughs> I thought like, I, I, if in 2007, I would have told you that by 2024, there will not be a single restaurant that doesn't use a schedule. Like, obviously it's not going to take that like, like five years from now, probably every restaurant <laughs> will use, you know, whoa, could not have been more wrong about that. Cause there's still tens of thousands that, you know, use Excel. And, um, I'll and, bet you there's more. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, there's I would I would be willing to say that there's tens of thousands that don't even use Excel, that don't even Pencil know how paper. to use Excel. Yeah, pencil and paper. And you know what? And I tell people all the time, if that works, man, just do that. Like it's fine. If it gets to the point where it's a problem and it's like taking a lot of time and it's always something, well, then we have this real simple solution for you. And the difference, I think, you know, when you ask about you know, like the story, Sean, is that. We, we were fortunate early on to realize that we didn't need to, uh, didn't need or want to get venture capital. And we wanted to have this profitable business with a small team and we were willing to sacrifice. Okay. So, well, then we sacrifice growth. Okay. Like we won't grow as fast. That's fine. Um, we won't, you know, have all the headaches that come along with venture capital and trying to grow that fast. We wanted balance. We all like, like I'm 49 right now. We're all in that age range, 49 to 52, whatever. We all have kids Our, you know, my, my oldest is 20 now. So, you know, when we started, like she was like, you know, we've all had kids during this process and we were all able to grow this business to where it is while having balance in our lives yeah. and enjoying our, our kids childhoods. And I mean, I have more time on my hands now than I did for a long time, just because my kids are grown and I'm not cool anymore. And that, you know, like I have to <laughs> beg them to spend time with me where, so it was neat. We all got to do that. And, um, 
you know, we just decided like, it's okay if people will grow into us and Hey, guess what? If they get to the point where they outgrow us and they need everything in one place, then, you know, like through toast or whatever, else, like, okay, that's fine because there's always people that will grow into us. And there's always people hanging out a shingle for their first you know, time, like their first restaurant. They don't need all that stuff. They just want something simple. And there we are. Do you remember the the first restaurant you you signed? Well, you know, it's it, so Wes had some friends that own restaurants and um that you know that kind of used this for a while and battle tested it and poked holes and stuff like that. But um, you know, Cafe Luna in Raleigh was our first paying customer and I mean they're still a customer today. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just you know, so there are um and they're they have their one restaurant and they they do what they do and they do it consistently and they do it well and they don't have a lot of complicated needs and they're happy. Like they're like us. Like it, it's just, it's simple and it works and like we're good. And that, that's the perfect customer for us. I mean, we've got a uh, close to a thousand customers that have been with us for over 10 years. That's um, amazing. So yeah. Yeah. When you look back on the journey, the 17 years of building schedule fly, what was the most challenging year? Oh, well, hmm. that would be a toss up between COVID where, you know, I mean, we, we were in the process of buying a house at the time. We had been in our house like 15 years and three kids and we kind of outgrown. We were in the, I, I never forget calling, you know, my realtor and being like, this is like, you know, right when everything shut down, I was like, just this deal's off. Like, I can't buy a house right now. I don't even know if we're going to have a business in a year. Like, I can't, yeah. you know, like who knew, right? Like, you didn't have any clue what was, I mean, you could be optimistic and hopeful, but it was a really weird, as you know, as a restaurant, like it, it was a scary time. Um, and that was really challenging. And of course, you know, we're better off for it now, but January 1st, 2022, 6.30 a.m., we, you know, I get a phone call, hey, we got we got attacked, you know, ransomware attack. And we were down Ooh. for 12 days. Oh yeah, dude, it was horrible. And um, we were down for 12 days. We had to pay a Bitcoin ransom payment at some, I won't cuss, but some person over in Russia. And, um, wow. but you know what we, uh, and we lost customers because of that, of course. But what we learned, man, is, you know, like we just serve independent restaurants. Like our biggest customer might, you know, be a group with, 15 or 20, but most of our customers, you know, two, three location kind of thing. And um, because we've always taken great care of our customers, I mean, like we're obsessive about it. The loyalty factor was through the roof and we had people going back and having to learn how to do Excel that had never used Excel. They're like, I've never done anything else but schedule fly. And they, you know, they stuck it out with us. So that was like super challenging and really, really hard. But then now we're like bank level security and, Customers that had no idea how small we were learned about it. We were putting out a video every single, that was when like, that's when we really realized the power of storytelling and communication, Sean, in a big way, because I would sit there in my home office every day and film a video. They're still on our Instagram, like now. Awesome. And, um, you know, telling everybody what's happening. Like we were very, very open about it. As open as we possibly could be where our negotiators that were trying to negotiate a ransom payment were like, don't say too much because we don't want them to use it against you. But we were very clear with what was going on. And dude, it's been two years and I will still get a call once a week, twice a month kind of thing where, you know, somebody will call me and they'd be like, man, you remember when you had that ransomware? Like, yeah, I remember. And they're like, you, you all telling us what was going on and, sh and being so honest and authentic. And like, we didn't know you only had five people. We thought you were some big, huge company, you know, and, it was five of you and it like hit home and it kind of related you to us because we're a small independent restaurant. We're up against the big guys and it just turned into like this horrible thing that turned into a blessing in the skies in some ways, if that makes sense. So for us, because we're willing to look stupid, sound stupid, create a show, 
make videos, make podcasts, make blogs. We're able to connect with people all over the globe. And um, one of those special people, leaders that I've connected with is Jim Taylor, who's in Canada. Uh, recently, yeah. actually, as recently as this week, um, when we're recording this episode, you were a guest blog post and you wrote why you want your kids to work for independent restaurants. Can you share with our audience the inspiration behind why you wanted to write that and uh, your relationship with Jim? Well, first of all, I have a ton of respect for Jim, also connected on LinkedIn. Um, and I love, I mean, if you don't follow, if, you, if you're on LinkedIn, well, first of all, if you're not on LinkedIn, you can listen to this, you should be on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a LinkedIn weekly uh, podcasts that you, the listener, can join. So you definitely you need to be on LinkedIn. This be is on LinkedIn. This is, you've and, been waiting. This is the call to action to make it happen. This is it. And follow Jim Taylor. I mean, you yes. know, obviously follow Sean and, but follow Jim Taylor. Uh, he's awesome. Love that guy. And, uh, he was kind enough to reach out and, and say, uh, you know, could I, could I put that post up? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> can go right ahead. I don't know if anybody will read it. Turns out a lot of people read it. I think <laughs> he told me that, uh, he texted me about that yesterday. Um, so I, I wrote that post because look, when we got this going, I didn't, I mean, I'll be, I will be fully transparent. I did not have the amount of love and appreciation and respect and passion for this industry that I do now. I thought this will be a good business. We can make good money on it, make a profitable business and it'll be fun. And like, I bet we can get a lot of thousands of restaurants to sign up. But through, through doing the podcast, I mean, this podcast started with just trying to get content for a blog and it turned into some books and some video series and all this stuff. And we've done another 500 episodes. And man, what I have learned is I have so much respect for people that own and run particularly independent restaurants because it's hard. It is really hard. And there are, but there are so many just wonderful people. So all these years and all these owners, I keep talking to and I would like do an episode and I'd be like, that guy or that gal is like incredible. And you start thinking about it, like, you know, like what makes us, what makes a, a town or a city um, or a little village great? It, it, like if you, whatever the size of that place is, if you start figuring out like, why is that a great place? It's always going to come down to like, one of the factors and one of the most, the top factors is, well, they've got all these cool local businesses, local independent restaurants, local independent restaurants are where people become regulars and they know the staff and the staff knows them. It's where they take their families to enjoy good times and mourn and bad times. And the business owners that own these restaurants are investing into their communities. All the money is staying in the community because they're paying people that live and work there. And then they're taking food and money and time and investing it back into the community. So the whole cycle is like just beautiful to me. Like I love it. And in addition to that, you know, I started thinking like it, whatever my kids do one day, if they all work in an independent restaurant at some point, the skill sets are off the charts, all that you have to learn working in a successful hustle and bustle happening independent restaurant, particularly on a, you know, a fast paced night and there's met metaphorical or literal fires happening and all this yep. stuff and happy guests and frustrated guests and, and like keeping your cool. And, you know, you got an owner that like, you've got an owner of the business who you're, you're watching and you're seeing how he or she reacts and how do they handle things. And, and then they're dealing with like, every aspect of the economy. It's just a unique place where I feel like the skill sets from, um, being able to connect with guests, being present, being intentional, being kind, being empathetic, learning to sell, learning to work as a team, learning to deal with, you know, Sarah or Johnny who came in upset, you know, cause they broke up with somebody and try, like all this stuff that you learn is like so transferable. Like, you know, it's amazing. So what you would learn working in an independent restaurant, if you can figure that out, that skill set is transferable anywhere. And so not only have I come to really love the end, I mean, now I actually wrote that post years ago and I, I resurfaced it. it. And because my that was when my daughter was 13. Now my daughter's 20, 19, son's 17. Both of them have worked in independent restaurants now. So I'm two for three. My 14 year old is going to be 
like probably next summer. <laughs> uh, and I don't know that they'll wind is up. Is this in a restaurant. requirement to stay in the household or is this well, you know, is a heavy suggestion? <laughs> you, but I'll tell you what, Sean, when I had you on our podcast, you said exactly what I was hoping that they will get, which is you, when you had to work, yep. you know, been your family, you didn't like it back then. I hated you it. You didn't want to do it. You hated it. There you yeah. go. And then over time, as you grew as a young man and you started to mature, you started to realize like, oh, wait a minute, look at all that I got out of that and yeah. how fulfilling and rewarding that was. And look at all the skills that I built there. So I truly, I mean, I say this passionately, I, like I believe very much, I wish it were all my, like, I'm not big on like requirements, but I, it'd be not that bad if everybody was required to work in a restaurant at some point in their, you know, teenage years, because it, it, you learn as much there as you're going to learn. It's like restaurants and maybe being on a, like a really dedicated athlete on a sports team, the lessons you learn are, st well, you'll take the rest of your life. Um, I really believe that. So. I would love for you to share this belief that you are not alone. Um, you can't be a podcaster. You can't be a creator. You just spoke about sharing your truth and repurposing content. So many people, why we do this show is hopefully to inspire the person that's listening, the person that's watching to know that you have to hit publish. Once you hit publish and you speak your truth, no matter what that is, if it's short form, long form, audio podcast, video, whatever it is, that is what your gift is to the world. That is you as a creator, as an entrepreneur, that's you going outside of yourself and contextualizing. This is why you believe in independent restaurants. You wrote that how long ago? Seven years ago. Seven years ago. And I'm sure when you posted that, that made an impact, even if it was just an impact of one. Mm -hmm. But most people don't think that they can repurpose something or publish it another time, not understand how much it meant to me, how much it meant to me to read that article, to see it in Jim's newsletter, to go, oh, yeah. my God, I'm going to be talking to Will today. I can't wait to talk to him about that. But also to bring me back to thinking of my days, early days, when I'm working seven days a week, opening, closing the restaurant, how much I enjoyed interacting with the guest, interacting with my team, teaching my team. And because now I'm not in that place anymore, but how also valuable it is. Speaking your truth, sharing your truth allows you to share that story with me. For you, bring me back to not being alone. Because in the beginning, when you started podcasting, nobody's listening. You're having a trouble to get even the person on the show, let alone the person's wife or husband to listen to the episode. Yet because of your consistent, persistent pursuit, you've done over 500 episodes, over 600,000 downloads. You've given this gift, which became a book, which became repurposed content. But it also has to start with this crazy idea that you're not the only one that feels this way. Well, you know, um, there were, there were some people that I, that this is when it, the, really the light bulb went off for me was I started interviewing people. And again, we were literally posting the audio files on our blog. Like you would have to click, you know, and then I was like, you'd have to stay on the web page to listen to the internet. Yeah. It was before there was even like a way to easily produce a podcast and upload yeah, an like RSS it, feed that a, yeah. a distribution like Blueberry or Libsyn that sent it to Apple Podcasts. And you know, the Spotify wasn't even a thing until what? Spotify wasn't a thing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but you know, that it, we did, I mean, we did our first book and, we self-published restaurant owners on court. I mean, that's kind of our, you know, within schedule fly, like where we tell stories as restaurant owners on court, it's all part of schedule fly. But, uh, you know, we've done two books, the podcast, we've done a bunch of films. Um, but the book we, we self-published that in 2010 or 2011. I mean, I spent a year working on that. The reason we did that was because it's like these stories, like, Scott Maitland at Top of the Hill Restaurant and Brewery in Chapel Hill or Dave Query who owns Big Red F out in Boulder. And I mean, some of these pe people, they're, I'm like, they're so dedicated to what they do and they're so, they have business smarts and street smarts and heart and passion and intention. And like, God, if nobody's listening to our blog, like how do we get, our, you know, 
listening to our blog, but how do we get these stories out in a different way? Like people need to hear these. These are incredible. These are amazing people. And so we self-published that first book and it was, you know, basically just a compilation of conversations I had with 20 different restaurant owners from around the country. And I talking about being alone, dude, I spent a year, like six to eight hours a day on my laptop, listening to the interviews and transcribe. I didn't want to pay anybody to transcribe it. I didn't want to pay anything for any, because I was like, man, we might not sell, like we might sell one copy of this book, Like maybe nobody will even buy it. I mean, who knows? Like we've never, like I've never done a book. Like what happens if nobody buys this thing? I'm going to look like an idiot. But I was like, but these stories are darn good. So if anybody gets their hands on it, they're going to like them. And sure enough, like we self-published that book. We put a little note, told our customers about it. And we sold a lot of books um, and it was really highly rated and people loved it. I mean, we sold, I don't know how many we've sold now, 15 or 20,000 copies, but you know, we sold half of those in the first couple of years. And um, so that was very scary, but the fact that people were buying that and the fact that, you know, more and more people were listening and the fact that quite frankly, I just knew like, you, it, these are great stories and they're great people. And I'm just going to lean in and just, I want to share these stories. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but like, we're going to go down swinging. Um, and, uh, I, but I, I'll be honest, I was terrified. Like I literally put it out there. I was like, Oh, nobody's going to buy this freaking book. Nobody's going to buy this freaking book. This is going to be a disaster. I spent a year doing this. Like, why did I do this? Uh, and luckily that was, you know, like turned out well. Where did you come up with that quality to lean into your fear? Oh man, through freaking failing enough times that I realize it's okay. Like, so what, you know, you, you have to, um, I had a big ego coming out of college and got, you know, that, that got set straight pretty fast in the real world. And, um, which is a healthy thing. And we had, um, I mean, our, our previous business, we were all five part of a previous business. That's how we knew each other, all of us at ScheduleFly. Um, and we had started, you know, started that business in like 2000 and we sold it in 2007. And I screwed up. I mean, I made so many freaking mistakes and screwed up so many things and, you know, just realized like oh, the world didn't end. And, you know, when you make a mistake, you either, you know, you, you learn from it and you get better from it and you almost start to welcome those things because you start whittling away like, you know, you, you A-B test stuff and you tinker and you figure out, okay, that didn't work. Cool. Like, that's actually good because now we know not to invest energy there. Let's try this. And you just keep going until you find things that, you know, that work. I mean, I tried a lot of things early on at ScheduleFly that didn't work at all. Like partnerships with food distribution, like things like that that were just complete failures. Like, okay, now we know. So, and I tell my kids, I'm like, failing's good because if you try, I read this in a book one time, I thought it was really cool. If let's just say you're like a, uh, you're hunting for, you know, a, a sunken pirate ship in the ocean, right? You know, there's a, then you know, there's a treasure down there. There's a big treasure chest and you know, it's in this giant, like maybe it's in the Atlantic and that's all, you know, and then you're, you're on this crew and you're looking for this treasure. Every day that you don't find it is actually a success. Why? Yeah. Because you've just narrowed down. Okay, that area is not there. Okay, so it's got to be. And then you keep, and eventually you get there and you figure out, like, boom, there's our treasure, right? But so all those failures are good. And as long as you put your ego aside and use those as a tool to learn, not as some, you know, if you leave your ego in there, you get hurt and you get whatever. I did that when I was a young man. I don't do that now. <laughs> I don't mind screwing up. That's a good thing because uh, we learn from it and we get better, right? Looking back on the partnerships, and I think it's it's interesting from a tech perspective of how do you partner with food distributors or equipment companies, beverage companies, whatever it might be, because so many restaurateurs need technology advice. What did you learn from the the failed partnership? Well, you know, man, we we did that so early, Sean. Like we were just too far ahead of the curve with a lot of you stuff. You guys are very early. <laughs> I mean, we really were like yeah, I mean the iPhone like, came out in two, uh, June 29th, 2007 is when the first iPhone dropped was available for purchase. Yeah. You guys were you guys were doing work, like great work on restaurant tech so early, so early. We we really were. And so it was like I had this food distributor in the Northeast and I'm, you know, 
went up there and and I uh, trained all their folks and all that. And we were just getting nothing from it. And I was like, well, this is a bad idea. This isn't going to work. Like we don't, like nobody's knows how to, sell, whatever it was. It just, we just stopped doing that. And we stopped doing a couple of other things. Um, I mean, we went to uh, the National Restaurant Association trade show in 2009. Yep. And we had this little booth and it was us and the, like it was the fortune, it was fortune for a startup. 15 grand yeah. and like, you know, <laughs> Wes and I went up there and, Got, I mean, we met the food distributor there. I was like, well, at least we met them. We'll go get them to sell a bunch of stuff. We were just too far ahead of this stuff. I and mean, it was just us and hot schedules at the time. There's nothing else there. And, um, you know, it, uh, so we just bailed on doing all that stuff. I was like, well, okay, well, that doesn't work. And this doesn't work. And, th and this one, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe we should start creating content, <laughs> you know, like try to get our brand out there, uh, and, you know, in a cost effective way. And, you know, we sort of failed into doing, you know, using content as a, a meaningful way to give our customers a platform to educate and to inspire people and to get our, you know, the schedule fly brand out there, um, in a really cool and creative way, which we only had because with five people and, you know, no resources, we didn't like, we've never made a sales call ever. Well, that's not true. Wes and I flew to California pizza kitchen out there near y'all uh, yeah. up in LA Early, early on, early days, first year, we went out there, we met with the CTO and um, the guy's like, I'll never forget it. He, Wes does a demo and he says, um, you know, this seems perfect. It just seems too easy. It seems too simple. I, I feel like <laughs> something's missing. And we're like, what's missing? And he's like, I don't know, but I'll, I'll think about it. And we get in the car, we leave and we get in the car and Wes is like, we, we'll never sell to chains, dude. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, because they're so used to everything being so complicated and our solution's too simple and they just, it's just, it's not going to work. And I'm like, well, but yeah, but I do enterprise sales. Like, what do you want me to do? He's like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. And so, <laughs> I mean, that's what my previous life was. I thought I was going to be running around selling to chains. And so we yeah. figured like, well, that isn't going to work. We failed if you want to say it that, but uh, we pivot and start creating content. Is there anything that you haven't done on your journey because of fear? Hmm. God, what a profound question, man. Is there anything I haven't done because of fear? Uh, not with schedule fly. I certainly have not done things earlier in my life because of fear. Um, but no, I mean, I think we've done everything the way we wanted to do it with schedule fly. I mean, it's, it's hard. Like, okay, here's an interesting story. I wrote a blog post one time, Sean, was called why we left $250,000 and a million headaches on the table. And it was early on. And there was a guy who knew about us. He had used us somewhere and he went to some like regional chain. I don't remember which one it was, but he's like, I want to deploy a schedule fly. It's going to be, you know, this number of locations, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, you do the math. We're like, that's a $250,000 a year contract for us. When we probably had, 50,000 a year in revenue. I mean, whatever it was, like it would have been a big deal. It was more revenue than we were doing, I think at the time. And um, I'm like, at first I'm like, well, we should probably do that. And then uh, Wes is like, dude, we we'll never make him happy. Like it, he may be happy now, but they're going to want more. And we're not doing that. Like, that's not what we do. And I will, I mean, like I was, kind of, I was scared at the time. I was like, if we run away from that, like, you know, what's going to happen? Like, we got a long runway to make up that some other way. How are we going to do that? Slept on it. And we were like, you know what? Forget that. And I called the guy. I'm like, look, man, we're not going to do this. He's like, what do you mean you're not going to do it? Like, of course you're going to do it. It's a lot of money. No, we're playing the long game. Like, well, you will own us essentially, right? You will tell us what to do, what to add. It will be all, because you're spending all this money and then we won't be happy. And, and so it's $250,000 and a million headaches that come with that. And we don't want that. Like, we're good. And I was a little scared to make that phone call and walk away from that. It turned out to be a phenomenal decision. Best, you know, one of the best decisions we made um, because we, you know, we don't have any customer that has any, you know, we take great care of our customers. We have no, nobody has leverage. Like you better do this or we're, you know, we're yanking the plug and going, okay, like that's okay. Like no problem. You know, somebody else to come along to fill the, fill your shoes. What, in the last since you've been running schedule fly and building what have you changed your mind on 
Hmm. Well, um, that's a great question. And that's been over the last couple of years. Number one, I never used any, I like the, we barely ever scratched the surface with social media. I didn't really use LinkedIn. Um, back in like May, I think of this past year, um, I was like, you know what? We need like our big challenge is awareness, Sean. Like, I mean, most people in hospitality, like you, you had probably never heard of us and we've been around 17 years and. Oh, I will tell you to your face. I'll tell the audience right now. I wouldn't know about you if it wasn't for your commitment to LinkedIn. Okay. There you go. So on LinkedIn. See, That's how I found you. Boom. Worth it right there. So, so here, we, like we think, you know, you live in these worlds where you're like, like I go, well, we've got, you know, 6,000, like everybody must know about us. They just have chosen other, whatever. Well, the reality is like the overwhelming majority of people in hospitality have no freaking clue who we are. And I've, that's yeah. really hit home the last couple of years. So awareness is a big thing for us. Like people come across us, they're like, oh, wait a minute. Like this is simple, great. Like they, like this is, wow, how come? I wish I had known about you. Um, and in LinkedIn, my, so six months ago, I'm like, I'm going all in on LinkedIn for a year. I'm going to see what happens. Like, but I am going for it because I don't do things half ass. So really decided to just push the chips in. And it's been, I mean, you, Jim Taylor, like Jim Taylor, all these folks, it's like been totally worth it, right? Because what's our biggest problem? Awareness. What's yeah. happening right now? I'm on a podcast. It's going to put the, our brand in front of a lot of people. Like it's awareness. So I've changed my mind on that. And, um, I've also changed my mind on, uh, on I say I've changed, it's not I, it's we, our team, we've changed our minds on partnerships because forever, particularly with those early, like, I don't know about these folks and I don't really necessarily want somebody else speaking for our brand and all this kind of stuff. But I've, you know, we've realized like we've started to work with um, other businesses like Pop Menu and Kickfin and other companies that are growing that have, you know, just a it's important to us that they're, uh, they're growing. That's great. But what's really important to us is how do they take care of their customers? Yeah. Right. Like, so I've actually leveraged, it's been cool because I've leveraged the podcast to help narrow down, you know, who we, like, if we're thinking about partnering with somebody, what do I do? I go, let me have your CEO on the podcast. Yeah. And then I get to know the CEO and I get to know what they're really all about. And I go, okay, well, there may not be a great, not that they're not a good people or whatever, but they're probably not the right fit, different culture, whatever. But like pop menus, like home run, great people, great product, yes. great customer service, kick fins the same. And then of course I got my giving kitchen shirt on. And I know you're like, you know them Grateful. now. Great. Different, different deal. Uh, but I love, love the giving kitchen and what they yes. do for this industry. So it's been really cool, you know, to connect with people that have the the right intention uh, and are really trying to help the same businesses that we're trying to help. That's been very cool because we do, we just kind of stayed below the radar and did our own thing forever. And um, it's been very rewarding to build these relationships like with yourself. What creates energy in your life? Other energetic and positive people. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, we're... um. I like personally, this has been a challenge for all these years for me because we're, a, we're a virtual company, dude. Like I'm in, I live on a farm in Waxhaw, North Carolina, just South of Charlotte. <laughs> uh, Tyler's up in Raleigh. He works out of his house. Wes, Charles, Hank, they all live in Wilmington. We don't have an office. They work out of their houses. And, and those guys are like, that's kind of how they roll. Like they're more technical and I'm like a social animal. Like I, I love being around people. I love being around positive energy. I need that. I feed off that. So like I work in coffee shops and like, I, even if I'm just around people, if I don't even know them, like I, I need that. But to your point, it's been a big, it's been very fulfilling for me over the last, you know, doing the podcast itself because I'm always talking to positive, happy people and I get to share their story. But, you know, um, but then now building relationships with you, with Jen Heidinger Kendrick down there at Giving Kitchen, with Jim Taylor, with John Piccarillo and the team at Pop Menu and Brian Hassan and all the folks at Kickfin. Yep. And, you know, we're working with, I mean, I, you got your toast hat on there. I, I, but, you know, like I've built, a, we're building a really good relationship with GoTab, which is this growing point of sale company and Tim sure. McLaughlin, who's a CEO there. And Tim's great. I, I've had Tim on my show. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, Tim's great. Dude is, 
he's gritty right. and he hustles and like he's so entrepreneurial. I love it. Yeah. He's a CEO, but he's like he's in it. You know, he's oh, yeah. so it's it's cool. And uh, that that's really like a very positive thing for me. And my wife loves it because the more I I like unleash all this energy on other people. <laughs> You know, like she doesn't have to, like I can overwhelm people. So she's like, you know, she knows when I've had a day where I did a bunch of podcasts, she's like, oh, you're not just overwhelming me with all your <laughs> pent up energy right now. Like that's a cool thing. <laughs> so what tool does Will use to schedule his life? Uh, I don't have much of a schedule. <laughs> <Dude, laughs> I don't even like calendaring things, man. Like I kind of, like I still roll around a lot. And I, I'm like a guy that calls people. Like I just pick up the, I like I'll be driving. I'll call my friend. They're like, dude, why don't you just call me in the middle of the day. No, right, man, yeah. let's talk. It's not on my calendar. I don't have, you know, like I still do that. I still do stuff you did in the early 2000s when it was like cool as shit that you had a cell phone, you could call yeah. somebody like, and everybody's gone past that. And I, I just, I still do it. Um, but uh, I try to main, like my schedule is primarily podcasts, you know, like, this was on my schedule today, on my calendar or whatever. And um, those are the things I schedule. And otherwise, I try to keep things pretty loose and open. And I mean, over a thousand customers, end users have my cell phone. I that, I mean, I because I want, like if somebody calls me or texts me, like I want it like right away. Yep. That's really, really important to us at ScheduleFly. It's like our foundation is really simple software. Okay. Point, click and go. We've never done a training session. Like you know how to use it. And if you, but if you got a question... Then you email us, instant response. You call and pick up the phone. You text, done, right? And the reason we can do that with five people and, you know, 250,000 end users that logged in 50 million times last year is we get like, we get like 30 emails a day and, you know, mm -hmm. five phone calls or whatever. So we're on it, right? Like that's really important. That's interesting for someone like you, I'd love to hear what do you do for yourself? I mean, I know grit is the way. Why is grit the way? That's my little... he's, la he's laughing because that's his Instagram handle. So grit underscore is underscore the underscore way. You can't hide from uh, me on the internet. I'll find you wherever you are. No, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, uh, grit is this little thing we came up with called guided rigorous interval training. So I've got this, uh, I got like 15 years ago, second kid comes along and like, I'm getting like out of shape. I was, you know, I was athletic growing up and all that stuff. I'm always was in good shape. And I was just, I went to do a training session uh, at the gym. I took my wife's training session and uh, she was sick. And I was like, well, I don't want to spend 50 bucks for this 24 hour cancellation. I'll go do this session. She's like, well, Melissa's going to kick your ass. I'm like, Melissa. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and uh, the first thing Melissa says is do a pull up. And I was like, well, I could do freaking 16 pull-ups when I was in high school. No problem. I couldn't do one, not one. I had to have 70 pounds of assistance. And I went, holy cow, I'm only 33 years old. Like what's going to happen when I'm 43 and 53 and like a fire went off. And I was like, I got obsessed. And again, I, I don't do anything half ass right? So I've spent the last 15, 16 years like obsessing over fitness and nutrition. And I, this is all grown into like healthy living and balance and like, you know, taking the oxygen for myself, you know, first yep. so that I can take care of the people that I, that I love. And, um, so we do these, uh, crazy workouts in my pool in the summertime with kettlebells and, uh, going underwater with a kettlebell and coming up and doing a thrust or getting a breath, like stuff you probably shouldn't do, but, um, we call it guided rigorous interval training. We're kind of in and out of the pool and we kind of do these high intensity workouts for like 30 or 45 minutes. And, uh, so that's kind of my personal, like I'm obsessed with it. And uh, I got this group of all these people that come out there all summer and we do all these crazy workouts and just have fun. <laughs> I, lo I love it. I love it. So uh, every single week on Wednesday and on Friday on LinkedIn, you, the listener, you, the viewer can join us, come on stage. Uh, we do LinkedIn social audio, but it's a chance for you to meet the digital hospitality community. Um, it's a chance for you to tell us about what you're building and how we can help. So please join us doing that. We also do a social shout out this week's social shout out goes to Elizabeth Doss. It's at Izzy Inc. So if you want gifts, 
for your business, for your restaurant. Elizabeth makes creative gifts. Um, we have her working on some Cali barbecue ones, some digital hospitality ones, and we can't wait to share those with you. But a shout out to Elizabeth. She's always there in the leadership capacity, helping um, the group and contributing to the group. Will, who do you want to give a shout out to? Oh, wow. Well, first, I'll give a shout out to every Schedule Fly customer because we love our customers and we're super proud to serve all of them. Uh, if you want me to do a shout out to an individual, it would um, in the restaurant space. In restaurant tech, storytelling. Who's made it? Who, who, who made a memorable impact? That would, well, that would, I, would we don't we don't get opportunities to give shout outs, you know, in life until I started doing this segment on our show. I realize that, you know, especially with hospitality people and tech with it's, I want to shout out my team. Of course, the team, I want one person, one person that's going to go, well, I really appreciated you saying that. That was nice. Dave Query. Uh, Dave Query owns Big Red F restaurants. Dave and his bride, Dana, uh, they're in Boulder, Colorado. They've got 15, 16 locations now. Awesome. Schedule fly customer for, you know, over a dozen years. And he was, Dave was one of the people that when I, I, mean, I will never forget the first time I interviewed him. It was a, that was a big part of the reason I was like, okay, we got to do something more than just put this stuff on the blog. This guy's freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. And he's just some guy out in Boulder at the time. He may have had six or eight restaurants, whatever it was. But I was like, I could talk to that guy all freaking day. Amazing. And Dave Query has gone from customer to loyal customer to advocate for us to personal friend uh i mean who i consider a close personal friend now I, I stay with dave and dana when i go out to boulder um, i've stayed in their house when they weren't even in town um they're awesome when i took an rv trip with our family a couple of years ago all five of us went from waxhaw to boulder and we parked the rv in his you know in his house for for a week so dave query is one of the most amazing human beings I've come across in my life. He happens to be a, a, you know, a hospitality restaurant group business owner, but an amazing, amazing person and all due respect for him. And I can tell you that anybody that knows him would, would agree. And any, if you talk to anybody in Boulder, not just people in restaurants, just anybody in Boulder, they'll be like, Oh, that guy's one of the coolest people and the best people in ever. So uh, there's wow. a shout out for Dave Query. Well, Dave Query, we'll do you one better. We're gonna, you're gonna help me. You're gonna make an intro, and I'll get him on uh, entrepreneur. We'll get him on restaurant influencers to continue to share his story. So, thank you for, thank yes. you for giving him the shout out. But uh, we we would love to to go deeper with Dave. Um, thank you. We really appreciate that. You won't I'm gonna, it. So, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions that I think I will get the most interesting answers. No pressure on you, but this is the smartphone storytelling segment. So, <laughs> we believe that every single person that is listening to this show, every person on earth that has the privilege of having internet access on their smartphone, they have the opportunity to be their own media company, share their story, but you don't have a smartphone, you have a flip phone. So this is gonna be fun. Do you prefer text messages or phone calls? And I think I know the answer, but go ahead. I prefer phone calls, but don't let me forget, I'm gonna tell you why I might wind up with a with a smartphone, <laughs> but it will not have, it will only be used for what you're talking about right now. Okay. Um, I'm, your, me I'm, your media phone, your media production phone. Yes. I need, because dude, I made a video yesterday. Like I literally with this, like, so imagine me <laughs> standing there outside going like, Hey, well, I, like that's how I have to. And I was like, this probably isn't the best way to do that. Like maybe I need to have a, a laptop. Oh my God. The I'm laptop. not freaking kidding, dude. Oh, that is, I want a gif of that. I'm going to get, I'm going to get uh, Elizabeth to make a gif of, <laughs> of Will, of Will taking a selfie video with his laptop. That That's fantastic. That. Yeah. Um, how many emails do you get a day? Oh, um, we got, I get very, you, very, you, per, you personally, you personally. I mean, other than the schedule for support emails, I don't know. Five, maybe. Five. That's I don't impressive. get a lot of emails. Yeah. Do you get yeah. any that do you get any that you enjoy reading? Well, I mean, I read I read Big Red F's monthly newsletter today that came out from uh that's <laughs> there you go. I, I, I do you enjoy go. reading their stuff. He's good with words, so yeah, I do enjoy that. Um I get I mean my emails that I get that I enjoy would be things like um 
updates from podcasts that I listen to, or, you know, some of them that have their own Substack accounts and, and things like that, um, is probably the content that I consume electronically the most. What's the favorite book that you've ever been recommended to read? Ooh, I'm reading one right now that I love. It's called I Am Pilgrim. Um, so I go back and forth between business books and and fiction. I'm out kind of on a fiction kick right now. Uh, it's a spy thriller. It's freaking phenomenal. I can't put it down. How do you listen to music? <laughs> Why are you I, laughing? Because I, <laughs> I really don't have an outlet for that much anymore because... <laughs> You don't have a smartphone? <laughs> no, man. Like I have, like I listen to sports talk radio when I drive around or. Yep. Well, now do you I, AM radio? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the actually AM, they, I AM do. AM on I the listen, dial? Yeah. Like I, cause I have an old car. I have a 2012 Forerunner and it has a okay. CD player in it. So, and you know, I don't have a way to play music through it. Um, although I will say I do love podcasts and my daughter goes to Penn State, which is like nine hours away. And uh, you would appreciate this, man. I literally, when I drive up there, I download episodes of the podcast to my yep. laptop and then I take it and I wedge it in the center console. Yep. And uh, if it's loud on the interstate and I can't hear, I take my professional headphones like I'm wearing now and I plug them in and I listen to podcasts like while I'm driving like through that. That's Which fantastic. is ridiculous. Like, and it is laughable when I get that, <laughs> but you know, ridiculous. I had yeah. an iPhone 11 up until 2020, man. I mean, I, I had one, I was in like, but I didn't like who I was when I had it. And, uh, but I didn't have a way to use it. Like, like the way you use it now, which I'm starting yeah. to realize like, that's, that's a way to turn this into a tool. I didn't like the fact that I'm like constantly looking down or I'm at a, I'm at a stop light scroll. It was just too much. I was mm -hmm. like, well, I can't like have the discipline to control my behavior. I just need to get rid of the thing and see what happens. And I didn't think I, I mean, I deep down didn't think I'd stick with it that long, but everybody laughed at me and all that stuff, but you know, it, it works. Like I figured it out and it works and it's cool. It gives me a good, you know, good balance. How do you get directions? That's a challenge. That's it. Here's the, here's the problem, man. <laughs> Check this out. Like my, my car has navigation in it, so it's all okay, good. But you know much. what happens is it's because I have an old car and all, none of the I, new cars have that. So when I rent a car, I got problems yeah. because they don't have navigation. And it's like, well, just plug your phone in. Well, I don't have a, you know. So like if I go out, like the last time I went out to see Dave and Dana and all the all of our customers in Boulder, I got there and I'm like, I had to pull over and get on Wi-Fi and like screen print like a map and like screenshot it onto my laptop. And like, that's ridiculous. I get that. But it's so rare. It's like 3% of my time where it's a problem and the other 97% it's fine. So I figure out how to work around it. <laughs> I love it. Um, is there anything uh, that any parting words of wisdom you'd like to share with the community? I really appreciate the time and the the vulnerability, the truth. I'm grateful that we're connected. And I know this is just the beginning. We'll do a lot of collaborations together into the future. And uh, obviously, anytime you come to San Diego or anybody that listens to this show, you guys uh, let, let me know. But Will, anything you'd like to share with the community before we head out? Dude, I would just share that y'all are very fortunate that this badass Sean is doing what he's doing. He works his ass off. He's creative, he's innovative, he's thoughtful, he's genuine, he's genuine, he's genuine. I think that's so important. That's why I emphasize that so much because I've talked to you offline, like, you know, and uh, life's too short to give time and energy to people that you don't believe are genuine and authentic. And uh, you are, and you've done a lot of amazing work for this industry and you're just getting started. And I think the industry is better off because of that. And you're also inspiring people to um, do things that they're uncomfortable doing and you're teaching them. And dude, I'm, I'm just like massively thrilled to get to know you and all of us at Schedule Fly are supremely appreciative that you gave, you know, the opportunity for us to share a little bit about our story, man. Absolutely. And uh, we're going to put links to restaurant owners uncorked, obviously schedule fly and grit is the way um, give Will a follow, <laughs> follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, like don't... 30 followers. <laughs> that's that's, that's all right. 31 <laughs> is all that matters. If all you, all you need, you know, my grandfather, I helped him self publish his life story um, at the end of his life. And his goal was not 
to be on the New York Times bestsellers list. His goal was for one boy in the village to read that book and to inspire that boy to get out of to to understand that that's not the only way that there's other ways to live life and um if you're curious if you get involved if you ask for help there's some incredible things that can happen and uh you're doing the work man i'm i'm grateful to meet you i uh truly appreciate your time and uh, we appreciate you guys for checking out this episode well you know it, i would say again giving kitchen if you don't yeah. know about the giving because they're also trying to create awareness right so i try we're, to we're all in on giving kitchen for sure we'll put links to them as well because we we signed up for the west coast representation uh right after will connected us to jen we had jen on the show but please what, what is giving kitchen doing givingkitchen.org they are they are for food service workers in crisis okay and they're amazing they started in atlanta they're big in Atlanta. They're huge in Georgia, and they're but they're all over the place now. And they've I think they've served people in all fifty states. And if you're a food service worker, and you eat just whatever your case may be, like you know your kid got sick, and so you couldn't work, and you can't pay your rent this month, whatever it is, you file, and they they help you. And they've given out um, over God, what is it like over ten million dollars now, um, and uh, over the last ten years, and. They're growing like crazy and they want people to know they exist and they're an amazing, amazing organization. So check them out. And Sean, you and I should have another conversation at some point um, on my show, your show, whatever. But on that note about the, the amazing people that not just own restaurants, but that work in this yeah. industry and this like mental health, physical health, like what are we doing to help? people that help us. It's an incredible group of people. It's an incredibly diverse group of people. And I think about that stuff all the time. Like how can we find tools and resources that help these, you know, amazing people that we're fortunate to serve or that we don't serve, but that are in this industry. Um, that's really important. Make yeah. sure that they're healthy and taking good care of themselves. Couldn't agree more. It's Will Brawley, Schedule Fly. Check him out. Give him a follow. And uh, thank you guys for listening. We will catch you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.